Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this week's edition of All Things Evangelism. I'm here with Carrie Ann Titchborn. She is a North New South Wales Conference church member, and we meet weekly with pastors, evangelists, Bible workers, and a spirit-filled, a God-centered Seventh-day Adventist church members as well to discuss different topics that pertain to soul winning and evangelism. Now, this week's podcast is about country living. Now, you may not know this, but the Bible and the spirit of prophecy give a lot of counsel and advice on where we live and the effects of where we live in, in our lives and whatnot. And so Carrie Ann has recently just moved to the country <laughs> and there was various reasons and, and motivations behind that. But I thought she's a perfect person to get onto the podcast and to consider some biblical information with and to talk a little bit about her story and what inspired her to do what she did and her husband, Dean. So thanks for coming on uh, to the podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure to be talking with you today, Matt. Yeah. So our families are friends. You and my wife are friends. Our kids play together from time to time. But we now are deprived of your presence because you moved from where to where? We moved from Kurunbong to a place called Worrell Creek, which is approximately seven minutes south of Maxville. And it's approximately four hours north of where we were previously. And, and could you tell us a bit about yourself and your family? Like you're married, you have a few kids. What's the, what are the numbers? Who, who are the people that, who, who composes your nuclear family? My husband is Dean Titchborn. Dean is an employee of the South Pacific Division. He works in IT. And together we have three children, two girls and one boy aged nine seven and five. Okay. So Dean is IT working for the South Pacific division, as you said, and you'd imagine he'd need to be in Sydney to work, but you guys moved just South of Maxville. How does that work out? During just works at a distance. He he is working from home while COVID was at its Zenith. We were presented with the opportunity and doors flung open for us to move up this way. So at the moment it is working out for Dean to work remotely. We're blessed with very good internet here. And at the moment, the situation is working out for Dean to to continue working in his capacity from home. Oh, that's so good. Hey, praise God that you guys were able to move to an amazing property and escape, not escape, escape the world, so to speak. And he still gets to maintain his job. So before we get into discussing country living, I wanted to ask you, what is it that inspired Dean and yourself to make that move, right? So you're living in a place that was probably pretty comfortable, family around, you know, Certainly. that's where you live for a while. And then you just say, hey, we're going to, we feel led by God to move away from our situation and get to a more rural setting. What was the, what's the story there? Going back 10 years ago, Dean and I were based in Kalgoorlie where Dean grew up. Um, he was based in the mines out there. However, I always had this impression that at some point the government would find a way to potentially restrict people from being able to travel across borders, not only internationally, but also within Australia. That thought really bothered me because I have all my family over this side. Furthermore, I have a deep sense of love for everything country, everything, mountain, give me green any day, give me outside any day. And just Kalgoorlie didn't offer that for us. Yes, we were very comfortable in terms of what we had there. We had the privilege of shifting over to Kurumbong going back about five years ago now when Dean took his appoint- appointment at the division. So we were based in Kurumbong. We were living on College Drive. We really loved it there. It felt like we were living in the country. We had the goats and the sheep out the back. And it was just such a beautiful place. We had so many friends that we would come in contact with on a regular basis by virtue of living on College Drive. However, Dean and I, we are both avid readers of Spirit of Prophecy. And when you go through books, particularly such as The Adventist Home, you can't help as a Seventh-day Adventist, but feel a sense of urgency about Ellen White speaking to us and telling us to present to God in prayer the opportunity to move into the country and all of the benefits around that, not only spiritually, but also as events close, just the things happening in our world and the advantages that we can secure for our family 
and for those around us as we follow the advice she's given there. So certainly Spirit of Prophecy really influenced our thoughts and our decision for moving country. That's cool. So what were some of the things that you picked up in your personal reading and studying of the book Adventist Home and other writings of Ellen White or compilations that you thought, okay, this is a game changer for us. Like th- this benefit or this, I don't know, just th- th- this thing that we will gain from moving into the country. This is what, what so what are the things you saw ultimately in, in Adventist Home that compelled you? So major themes that we picked up was first of all, this voice of urgency that you get from Ellen White. Language such as, now this one's in Country Living, pages 9 and 10. She says, again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities. And I'll continue reading on into the country where they can raise their own provisions. And then she goes on to say, for in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. So she talks about families taking their young children into the country. She gives one good reason there, and that is to raise your own provisions. In Australia, we can't imagine experiencing the kind of famines that we know historically places like Africa have experienced. However, I think a famine in Australia would look different to an African or another country that experiences the ravaging effects of famines. I think in Australia, a famine could perhaps be more something such as having no food on our supermarket shelves. We can imagine how most of us would go if the supermarkets were depleted of their products for an entire week. Now, we haven't seen that happen yet. I believe the possibility for that to happen in the future is a very real one. We hear Ellen White using language such as, let me read another quote in one of her letters, number 47 of 1903. She says, so long as God gives me power to speak to our people, I shall continue to call upon parents to leave the cities and get homes in the country. She goes on to say why where they can cultivate the soil and learn from the book of nature the lessons of purity and simplicity. So two very good reasons. One, we can raise our own provisions. Two, we can place our children in the most ideal environment to develop their character. That's so good. Just to throw some thoughts in there, if I could. If we want to be lights to the world at the end of time and... If the Bible's true, that a time of trouble is coming, such as never was since there was a nation, we have to realistically consider how we're going to be lights to the world. Like, how can you be a light to the world if you starve to death? It's just, if you can't physically sustain yourself as a church community, as a group of believers, then how in the world are you going to accomplish the mission that God has assigned you to accomplish at the end of time? So this idea of getting to the country and being able to sustain yourself, it's a very missional concept, right? Because as we approach more and more the end of time, we're going to see more disastrous circumstances coming upon the world. And if we are dependent upon, as you say, a supermarket system that's emptied out, you're you're finished. Like you, you can't sustain yourself. You can't live. You can't function. And there's a statement that Ellen White makes where she says that in the, in the, when the time of trouble begins, those that live in the country will live like Kings. She basically says, and she just means relative to the conditions of the rest of the world. And And I really think it's important for everyone to realize that Ellen White is not saying go out into the country for selfish reasons. So you can protect yourself from trouble. So you can just, you know, know, not have to bear what other people bear on planet earth, but rather so you could sustain yourself in sustaining yourself. You now have the capacity and ability to go into the cities and to go into, to the world and, and preach the gospel and to do ministry for the sake of others. So sometimes people Like I've heard people criticize this idea of country living by saying that's a bit selfish. You're just removing yourself to protect yourself. And then my response is no, it's on an airplane. If the oxygen masks fall down, they say that you need to put yours on first. And it's not out of selfishness that you do that. It's because if you pass out, you can't help anyone else. And so if you're a parent and the oxygen mask comes down, you need to put it on your own face. So that way you can go and help your kids. And I'd say that country living idea of You get to go sustain yourself and provide for yourself. Obviously, God wants us to eat. So he's saying, hey, I love you. Put yourself in a position where you don't have to starve because there's going to be very real issues that come. And at the same time, if you as a people can sustain yourselves when the world is going crazy, you'll now be, you'll still be able to minister. I think that's a really important point, hey? Absolutely, Matt. And in adding to that, if I can set myself up here where I can be as self-sustaining as possible and hence reduce as far as I can, like my current bills, then ultimately it 
frees up more of my finances while I can still give financially to put straight back into God's work. And certainly being based in the country doesn't mean for me that I keep myself exclusively to the country. No, I live bang smack in the middle of two major towns being the Port Macquarie region and the Coffs Harbour. So two major rural cities. I'm within a reasonable driving distance of both. And it is my prayer that opportunities will open up to perhaps evangelise to these centres. But even local, there are always people in every town, every city who need to be reached. There are people in the large cities like Sydney and Melbourne, but there are also people right here in Maxville. So I pray that wherever I end up, God continues to use me as a light as he best sees fit to those around me. Yeah, amen. Hey, so I want to throw something else in there too. That, that second statement that you read in regards to having the, the purest influences or the best influences around your children to raise them in. I think this is something that people don't consider sufficiently. People are influenced by their environment and by the people, the other people that are in their environment. And, and it's true, like it's true that even in the best environment, the devil can work. The rebellion against God began in heaven where there was no evil and no, there was nothing that would influence someone towards sinfulness. And so it's true that you can be in a perfect environment and a war and a rebellion against God and his goodness can break out like amongst angels. We see that's true, but it's also true that there are environments that are more and less conducive to spiritual growth. And I think as parents, it's important as we as we raise our kids to consider what is the best possible environment that we can place them in for their benefit and their spiritual well-being. And I really appreciate that you guys made a principal decision as God led you to put your kids in the best possible circumstance for their growth and their development, as both spiritually and physically. My, Sharice and I talk all the time about our boys and how we want to get them on a property because we have to like invent work for them to do around the house. Like we want to teach them, we want to develop their character and make them strong young men and disciplined young, young men. And I give them jobs to do and they work with dad around the house and, and whatnot, but we're just in a normal neighborhood. So it's, if we were on a property that we got to build a fence together, dad and the boys, or we've got, we're going to build a little chook pen together. And so you've got real tasks that need to be done on a regular basis. And we can employ our sons in working together with us as a family to just care for our property and we feel that this will be a great opportunity to teach them practical lessons that we won't be able to teach them where we are right now. Having the privilege of exposing our children to authentic, practical tasks is such a blessing. And not to say that it can't be done anywhere, but certainly the tasks are never ending. You get a country property and you've suddenly got a to-do list that seems to grow by the day. The maintenance issues and the wonderful ideas for having a little bit of land that you pursue. These all, these all take effort. They all take Lots of mini tasks to fulfill throughout the day and endeavouring to get the children involved is our goal where we are. And we're, we're certainly coming up with new ways, seems every day on how we can do it. But getting them outside, I think, is a really big part of it. Working out how we can make ourselves useful outside in a way that will benefit our whole family and hopefully benefit other people in time. It's a privilege. It is a privilege, Matt. Absolutely. Hey, so Carrie, and I have a question. What do you say, and I think this is like a valid question, but what would you say to someone who says, as a question to you, Jesus says we are the salt of the earth. And so, and so we're to season and flavor the world around us. And so if every Adventist moved away from an urban area, then there's no salt. There's no influence for God in that context, in that situation. And so surely we shouldn't all be moving to the country because that's removing the light from dark areas and people need light there. What do you say in, in that? Like, so, so, so should everyone move away? What would you say in response to that kind of thought? That Without a doubt, God does call individuals to the city. Do I have to strictly be living in the city to evangelize in the city? I would say for my personal situation, no. I have the means to travel at the moment. And through technology, I'm able to connect with many people in a way that we couldn't do, say, 15, 20 years ago. But when we explore the advice that Ellen White gives, particularly to families, she says, as an example, not nine families out of 10 are advantaged by moving to the city. Now, I totally get that people have work and people have endeavours to pursue that may only be fulfilled through city living. But at the same time, I would say we are called to prayerfully consider 
our priorities and our children and their well-being, balance that out with the advice given us through the word and through the spirit of prophecy, writings to determine whether our situation is better in the city or in the country. And look, back in Kurumbong as an example, a job that I did and I really enjoyed was helping out in the Sabbath school at our church while we've shifted and I'm able to pursue exactly the same role where I am here. So I think there's work to be done everywhere. Should everybody suddenly pack up and head off to the country tomorrow? No, I think God has doors to open for everyone individually at individual times. And I think for every person who would like to find the balance between being able to evangelize to the cities as well as have a country property, I believe God honors his work as well as our needs as his people. I really appreciate that. You know, there was a time in when I was back in the US where I was working with the discipleship school and we were accommodating them in, basically this was a, a school in Michigan, in the Michigan conference. And we accommodated all of our students in apartments that were in the city. And we moved our ministry to Central California conference. And we still did outreach to the community in the cities at the discipleship program, the tra- at the training program, but we accommodated students at a camp that was maybe 15 minutes outside of town in the mountains and maybe 15, 20 minutes. And it was interesting because as the outreach coordinator of that program, I noticed a significant difference in the results of the outreach when we moved to California and accommodated our students in a rural setting and then had them going into the city. And I've got my ideas and opinions about exactly why that was. You could chalk it up to the just disposition of the community. Maybe there were just more people open in that community. I'm sure that was the case to an extent, but I I really believe when I consider all factors, that one of those factors that contributed to an increased success in outreach ministry when we accommodated our students away from the city was that they developed a group personality and a social structure that was separate from the world that they were going in to minister to. And that made them a little more bold, a little more confident, a little more focused in what they were going there to accomplish. So it was almost as if the the mission was clearer to them when it was like, okay, we're out here participating in this discipleship program. We're in the woods. It's natural. It's beautiful. It's glorious. We're entertaining ourselves by going on hikes and we're not in the midst of a concrete jungle and the madness of the city and the world and the marketing campaigns and all of the materialism and craziness. And we're going to go in and our goal is to bring Jesus to the people, to share Christ. And I think we don't oftentimes realize that sometimes we're impeded in our mission, in our ministry, in our mission to our neighbors and friends by the fact that we identify so much with them as if like we are, and that kind of scares us then because it's, we're a part of it. It's, we're a part of the melee of the modern world. And that, that sometimes can hinder us from just being bold witnesses for God, where we're, you know, calling people to something new, calling people to something different. And I guess what I'm saying too, to a degree is that we get so comfortable in the world that we no longer have the capacity to call people out of it if that makes any sense. But anyways, hey, I want to say something else too. And I hope that that people will take me there. I want to say something else just in regards to the Bible. When we look at the Bible, we see tons of people who situated themselves in a country setting, but who did ministry in the city. And the premier example of that is John the Baptist. So he's basically living in the country. He's a country, an example of country living. And people would come out to him and hear the preaching of God's word out where he was in wilderness areas. Jesus himself was like oftentimes in places of, you know, no, and just no pop in in non-populated areas. And he'd travel itinerantly and go into cities, but he wasn't residing in cities, like just like inhabiting the city and kind of making that his, his abode, if you would. And I just bring that up because sometimes people mock the idea of country living as just some kind of right-wing fanatical way to approach religious faith. And I don't think so at all. I really don't think so at all. And there, of course, are people with extreme views who go run or run off into the country and hide their guns and they, they do all kinds of things and they have all kinds of crazy ideas. But that doesn't mean that you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's just because there are crazy people who move out to the country. It doesn't mean that moving out to the country is crazy. There could be good, solid reasons for doing so. Yes, I, I love how you point out that in the Bible, there are countless individuals who were great evangelists and massive preachers for God, and yet they situated their home in the country. Another example of that is Enoch. 
he was way up in the mountains and yet spirit of prophecy talks about him coming down and preaching to the people before God took him to heaven and yeah there's sure there are some right wing people out there who have some pretty tinfoil hat ideas about what's happening but we as Seventh Day Adventists have the privilege of knowing what will happen between now and the end we know time is short we know there are a series of crises to come upon the earth that uh, will make living as we know it difficult. And we know that we have been given very clear advice to put ourselves in a position just to make it, I think, as easy as possible. And as we say, not for our own selfish gain, but so that we are freed up as much as possible to help care for the needs of other people. If I'm in survival mode, how can I possibly help get other people out of survival mode? Indeed, we hope to share the resources that we have. If we have food that we can share with people one day, we really hope that we're able to do that. But we certainly pray that God will give us opportunities to witness to on his behalf each and every day. But if he wants to use us in a big way, and be it locally or be it in the cities, that he show us what he wants us to do. And I think continually committing what he has gifted us in prayer that we will be able to then continue bless other people is a big part of having a country ministry. Yes, said. Hey, what do you think about that that one little part of the Ellen White statement that you read, the second one, about learning from the ABCs of Abercrombie? Doesn't she say something to the effect of, like, in the country you can learn like the ABCs of evangelism? I don't know if that's the statement that you read, but... I know that in one place, Ellen White says something like, the, it, you learn the ABCs of evangelism from agricultural work or just working in a garden, on a farm, these kinds of settings. And it doesn't mean that everyone needs to be a farmer to be converted or to be a soul winner or to be knowledgeable in how to reach people for Christ. But she calls it like the ABCs of education. Of, what does she say in that statement? She continues to call upon parents to leave the cities and get homes in the country where they can cultivate the soil and learn from the book of nature, the lessons of purity and simplicity. She says the okay. things of nature are the Lord's silent ministers given to us to teach us spiritual truths. Gotcha. Gotcha. I just wanted to make, like, just wanted to see that's just a powerful thing. Hey, I just wanted to also ask you to comment on that a little bit more. Like the idea of just being taught by being in a natural setting. Yeah, certainly being in a natural setting where we are based, it's a very quiet place out here. So for one, we're not bombarded with the continual busyness of the city. And coming from one who has lived in a couple of major cities, I was based in Melbourne at one point. I was based over in London at another point. And on both occasions, I always thought they just, city living seems to by default come attached with a very busy price. And that's not to say we're not busy in the country, but in the country, we are keeping ourselves busy with tasks that keep us outdoors for a lot of the time, be it tending to our trees, be it planting new gardens, be it securing areas around the creek to keep that appropriate down the bottom of our property, working in the silence of nature and attending it with prayer, I think affords God the opportunities to give us lessons from his book of nature that really make a deep impression for us. And for our children as well. Well said. That's, that's so powerfully true. And I've found that to be the case in my life for sure. You get so busy and the pace of life gets so crazy. Centering yourself in God can become challenging. But in the country, you're just, you're almost encouraged by your environment to connect with God because it's just the, it's a more peaceful reality. Yet I found that in outreach ministry and in evangelism, a Bible worker, an evangelist, or a pastor who does three things is guaranteed to succeed. Like there's just three things that you do. Maybe I'll add a fourth to it, but there's three things you do to guarantee outreach ministry success as a Bible worker, pastor, evangelist, or whoever, or church member. Number one is having a solid work ethic. Like you, you know how to work because winning souls is hard work. And people don't oftentimes realize that. One of the reasons why we don't win souls is because winning souls is hard work. If it was easy work, everyone would do it. But it's not easy work. And that's why we don't see results because it's hard work. And many people don't have a stomach or a taste for heart for work. They don't have a, a work ethic or they're not willing to put themselves through the rigors that are required to win people. And so they don't win people. So if you have a work ethic, you know how to grind. Number two, you are 
you're profoundly connected with God. So connection with God and relationship with God, relationship with Christ, your your number one priority in life. So you're personally connected to God and you're personally studying and learning from his word regularly. So you work really hard. You're really genuinely connected with God on a personal spiritual level. And then thirdly, you see what's in front of you. You have the ability to see what's in front of you. You're willing to see what's in front of you because Jesus was not mistaken when he said that the, the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Like there's just few people who can reap and who are willing to work sufficiently and who can see what's in front of them. And it's interesting because in the context of his statement where he says the laborers are few, but the harvest is great, it was in Samaria where there was a ton of people to be converted that could be converted to the gospel and to the Savior, but the disciples didn't see it because they didn't see what was in front of them. They were only seeing what they were looking for. And so this is a huge challenge. Now, here's the reason why I'm bringing this up is because country living It teaches you, it encourages you, as we were saying before, to connect with God. Like the environment is conducive for connection with God. And the pace allows you more time for reflection, even in the midst of your work. But then also you have to work. Like you don't have to. You can live in the country and like Nebuchadnezzar and just like live like an animal. But there's just a lot of practical skills that have to be developed to live in the country. And, and and that's required in soul winning is a work ethic. So yeah, I just think living in the country can inc- can develop the skills and disciplines that are helpful in the act of, of evangelism and soul winning. Absolutely. And can I add as well, Matt, in exploring the compilation of quotes, for example, that I'm seeing in the Adventist home, the advice that I'm reading is quite specific in its nature particularly to parents not to say that others are not called to the country as well but a lot of the quotes that she repeats relate to families and parents taking their children to the country so there's obviously a very specific role that the country seems to play in time living families in developing the characters of our children now when we talk about evangelism We think about big cities and we think about atheists and agnostics and others who we need to reach in the city, but we also evangelise to our own families. We evangelise to our children. And what better way to evangelise to our children than to place them in an environment that is most conducive to that training? Yeah, amen. And hey, I want to throw something out there because like, I'm a skeptically minded person, so whenever even when I'm speaking, I'm always criticizing in my own mind. What am I saying? I'm always challenging myself in my own views. So my kind of skeptical, cynical side says, you can have a terrible family environment in the country. And But then my own response to that thought is, yeah, that's true. But the, the basic point behind the counsel of country living is providing the best possible environment. And so the issue is the environment. And so as a parent, when I want to win my kids to Jesus, when I want them one through the power of the Spirit, to Jesus Christ and to the gospel and the truth of the Bible. I'm going to give them the best physical environment that I can, that I possibly can, but I'm also going to provide for them the best social environment that I can so that in my home, in our home, we have a healthy, functioning family and where there's love and where our children want to be there. And it's a place of, of learning and growing and fun and healthy recreation so that our children love the environment of their home and they have a not just a physical environment where it's beautiful and you've got the testimony of nature speaking to the heart of the kids but you've also got a social environment in your home a spiritual environment in the home not an oppressive dictatorial environment but a loving genuine environment that affirms good behavior and that develops solid character traits and i think that's really that's really important so anyways i guess i just wanted to say that because i know that there might be people like me who are a bit like hey, that's fine. You're trying to present that going to the country is some magic solution, but you can have a great family in a bad city and the kids are going to be better off than a family that's functioning badly in a great country environment. And I'd say, yeah, I get that. That's true. But why not? But ultimately speaking, like we just want the best environments that we can for our kids, that we can have for our kids. Um, That's right. Yes, absolutely. There are many ways to provide our children with advantages. And this is one of those ways, but I think it's a big one. Obviously, it's not the only one. And that in the absence of parents who have a strong and close connection with Jesus, 
a family that obviously has that connection will be be better off in the city with that connection than in the country without it. But imagine having both. Imagine having that strong connection with God and having the environment that God, through spirit of prophecy, has ordained as the best possible environment Mm -hmm. for the fair majority of the children of families who are waiting for the Lord's return. Yeah, amen. And just to be balanced and fair, because I love all of the scripture and it, there's so many great lessons that come from many different angles. So to be very fair, I wanted to say and just mention what I think it was Nathaniel said when he was confronted with the idea that the Messiah may be from Nazareth. And, uh, and he said, maybe it was Philip. I'm not sure which of the two. Can any good thing come from Nazareth? Which seems to indicate that Nazareth was a town that wasn't the best place to raise kids. If you're going to say, can any good thing come from Nazareth? He's referring to a person. Can any good, decent person come from that place? Which seems to indicate that it wasn't the best place to be raised. But yet Jesus came from there. People who are limited by means and their circumstances do not allow, should not feel hopeless or despondent. Like we're not trying to discourage anyone because obviously Jesus's mom and his stepdad, Joseph, were able to provide the kind of spiritual environment necessary to bring up a great young man, a solid young man, a wonderful young man who was the savior of the world. And yeah, so I think, and also too, Daniel, right, who is this kind of wonderful example of faithfulness. He goes to Babylonian university and he maintains his integrity. He's in a circumstance that he has to be in. He's a captive and he's in the king of of Babylon's palace. And yet he's a godly, spirit-filled, Jesus-centered, God-centered young man who loves people and he loves God and he's faithful, like in an amazing way. So I'm not trying to say that by, by throwing this out there, I'm just trying to be balanced and broad in my assessment of scripture and just encourage people that whatever environment you happen to be in, there can be good results that come of it. We don't want to be haphazard and careless and say, well, just because Daniel did great, so I can do great anywhere too. That might not be the case for you, that Daniel's in a circumstance that he couldn't help being in, and and that's just the circumstance he was in. But he could be faithful he, anyways, and he could be an amazing witness for God as he was. On that note, can I give specific encouragement to our listeners who may be in that situation where they desire to move out to the country, but their current circumstances seem forbidding. We have been in the country now for about five months. Prior to that, we had been looking and praying for a long time. Dean, my husband and myself, we have been praying for probably about seven years on the topic of being able to move country. So we've been praying over it for a long time. And when COVID hit with great discouragement, we watched as house prices went higher and higher and we were tempted to feel discouraged many times but we sat down we wrote out a very specific prayer list of what we were hoping for in the country property that we had been dreaming about we based our prayer requests on the advice that we could find in spirit of prophecy writings we obtained a number of bible verses that we found very encouraging we went through All the advice we could find and we pulled out probably about half a dozen quotes from Spirit of Prophecy that pertained to our situation. And over the course of about two years, we wrote a number of letters to God whenever we were at a point where we felt it just seems impossible based on a number of factors in our circumstance that we'll ever get there. We just poured our heart out to God. And in our journal, we also had a section where we had answered prayers because to get to the point where we are now, we had some very specific things that needed to happen on a very tight timeline. And if there is anybody who has a desire to move out to the country because they feel it's best for their family or best for their situation, I encourage you to do the same. Write out your your list. Get specific with God. God is a specific, very personal God. And I believe he is honored when we get specific because He's a God of detail. Find Bible verses that speak to your heart about God's promises for you. I'd like to write to just read you one or two of the Bible verses that we pulled out. Psalms 84 verse 11, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And then Philippians 4 verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses 
all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So these sorts of promises and then one more, Psalm 37 verse 5 to 7, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. So these are the sorts of promises that we were claiming on a daily basis as we were waiting as patiently as we could for the property that God has seen fit to bless us with. And all listeners who would like the same, Spirit of Prophecy tells us very specifically, and I can tell you where she tells us, but she says God wants to give us places in the country. He says in Medical Ministry, page 310, under the section where it says God will help his people, she says at the end of it, God will help his people to find such homes out of the city. Talking about lands, uh, homes where you can grow um, orchards and so forth. So God wants that for I would say the majority of his people and I believe we have a role to play in securing our properties and that is to pray and to present to God who is a God of impossibilities everything that is on our heart that we feel he's calling us to. Amen. Amen. Well, Carrie Ann, it's been a pleasure to catch up with you and just hear your thoughts and hear a bit about your journey and really appreciate what you've shared. It's very inspiring and encouraging and yeah, look, we praise God for you and for your journey. And and man, God's good to give us this counsel, this insight to help us put ourselves in the best possible situation for the sake of our own families, our own souls, and our ministries to the world around us. And yeah, God bless you guys. And thank you so much for joining us this week. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless.